The Beastie Boys, the rap trio, sold millions of albums, and the two surviving members have now written a book about their experiences. Jeffrey Brown spoke with them recently at this year's South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas. It's part of our ongoing coverage of arts and culture, Canvas. They're part of hip-hop history, an unlikely part. Three white kids from Brooklyn, teenagers when they first met in high school, and combined rock, rap, and humor in a way that would speak to millions. You gotta fight for your right to I don't know how to describe that feeling that you have towards that thing or what that thing reaches inside of you. It spoke to us as kids, just it seemed like attainable. All of us just felt like, wait, this is for, this is like for us. One of the reasons I loved rap music was because I knew that nobody else at school would possibly mess with it. There was no way other kids at school were gonna love it, which is obviously so contrary to existence now. Things certainly changed for rap as it moved from its origin in the South Bronx to an international phenomenon. And the Beastie Boys, Adam MCA Yauk, Mike Mike D. Diamond, and Adam Adrock Horowitz helped make that happen. Beginning in 1986 with License to Ill, they made eight albums that sold more than 40 million records. The last came out in 2011, a year before Adam Yauk died of cancer at age 47. Mike Diamond and Adam Horowitz have now told the band's story in a book that takes us back to New York in the late 70s. It was this place where I feel like if you were the weirdo in whatever part of the world that you were from, you could move to New York without having a plan. You could just have this ambition that, okay, I'm gonna write poetry, or I'm gonna be a painter, or I'm gonna make some kind of weird noise music that nobody's ever made or heard before. Took a test to become an MC. Rap music was still in its early years, but the three teens liked what they heard and started playing around, literally. When we started rapping, we were terrible, like really bad. We just loved the music and we're having fun doing this, let's do it. Never thinking that anything would come of it. But they caught on. And soon enough, they were recording and performing and then had a new realization. We were playing with all these other groups, UTFO, Curtis Blow. It wasn't until we all of a sudden like, got in on stage in a room like this, like, like packed with an audience that we realized like, oh wait, we're like, we're kind of like the only white people here. We had no, we didn't know that that was all sort of what that was leading up to. Early on, they recorded with Def Jam, one of the most important labels in hip hop, along with groups like Run DMC. And they helped bring in white audiences as hip hop continued to grow. They told me of the good and sometimes bad ways that race came up. It's happened a lot of times over the years where, you know, a white person will come up or, you know, talking to a white person will be like, you know, I don't really like rap music, but I like you guys. What does that mean? That means like, you know, I don't really like those black people doing that thing, but you guys are white, so, you know, that's cool. So it's cool. okay with me. Yeah. yeah. So we're supposed to sign off on yeah. their racism. And your reaction is... Okay. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to say? What are you going to say right. at that point? Another issue in their story, their own sexism, misogyny, and homophobia. It was all over their early work in words, onstage antics, and videos. Even when I'm chilling, she acts the group, in fact, originally included a young woman, Kate Schellenbach. She was kicked out as the so-called boys, by their own reckoning, acted out in ways they came to regret. By the early 90s, they were rhyming verses about respecting women. We all hope that as we get older a little, you know, we grow a little and we learn, right? Mm -hmm. 
learning from mistakes, learning from friends, learn, you know, we, we, all we want to do is just learn and grow as people, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Not only that did you stop doing that, but you even made a message in another direction. Well, I think it's obvious, like, take the opportunity to actually be the example of change. That's the opportunity that exists there, you know, and be open to that in your actions. We played in this festival a while ago. One of the bands on the bill was this band, The Prodigy, right? And they had a song called Smack My Bitch Up, which was like a big song. And we had contacted them earlier before the show. and was like, hey, you guys, what would happen if you didn't play that song tonight? Because we feel like we might have to say something about that song because we feel like that's a messed up song, right? The message it sends out there, right? And they were like, well, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. Look what you said in the 80s. And we're like, okay, then we're hypocrites. But we're going to say something anyway. So maybe that, maybe that reached a couple people. It's all of our responsibility. They got involved in other causes, including independence for Tibet. But they were always about fun and friendship, even as they and rap music continued to evolve into a lasting international culture. As much as we never saw it going away, we also didn't see it being the absolute dominant pop music that it is now. Rap's always going to be relevant going to the future because it's always evolving and changing. You guys have been friends and still together, and you've lost Adam. How have you done that? I mean, it is an honest story of friendship. We did make a kind of decision, sort of. We had, like, the typical thing with a record label in the 80s where everything fell apart, we didn't get paid and suing, and like, all of that sort of stuff that you hear about bands. That happened to us. And so instead of, you know, it could have gone this way where we just never spoke to each other again, but we decided actually we started this thing as friends. We're going to end this thing as friends. So the friendship is the most important thing. Somehow yeah. it was a very adult decision, yeah. and we weren't adults at the time, but we made that decision. But I think it served us well. After the death of Adam Yauk, there will be no more Beastie Boys music. But Mike Diamond and Adam Horovitz are telling their story in a series of public appearances this spring. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown in Austin, Texas. Fascinating to go back and talk to them. Thank you, Jeffrey Brown.